cleanse my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands your feet. Unleavened Bread Bible Studies with Jesus, David Eels. Can quench my thirsting soul. Pure as water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. I trust in you. Greetings, saints. The Lord bless you. Let's pray. I want to share a message with you about who it is that is blessed of God. Well, Father, we ask you in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, we ask for your wisdom today. We need so much, Father, to have a, a true perspective of um, who it is that you bless, Lord, who it is that has your favor, Lord. Lord, we're just asking for your grace to open our understanding today, Lord. We want to have our minds renewed with your word and not by the traditions of men. So we'll have uh, a true perspective on this, Father. Lord, open our understanding today. Lord, help us to remember everything that you show us today, Lord. You said that your spirit would bring to our remembrance all things that you've said unto us. And Lord, we need that desperately. We forget so quickly, Lord, the things that you show us. And yet we know that your Holy Spirit can defend us in the days to come by bringing wisdom to our minds, things that you have put in us prior to these times. And so, Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name uh, for that wisdom today, that discernment today, that opening of our spiritual eyes and ears today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, saints. Thank you so much for joining us. And, um, I'd like to start in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1, mainly because the Beatitudes talk a lot about who it is that God is blessed. And we might just scratch the surface on this a little bit today, but we might continue on, Lord willing. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain. And when he had sat down, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and he taught them. Well, you know, our, our example is no man. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And, uh, you know, just it doesn't take very much for you to discover that Christianity has uh, put more emphasis upon its traditions than upon the example that's given us in the Scriptures. I'll just give you a little example the Lord gave me out of this verse many, many years ago. It says that when he had sat down, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. Uh, you know, I, I started to look in the scriptures for the example I was seeing in Christianity, what the preachers were following, what the religions were following, and discovered very quickly I just couldn't even find it, you know. Um, one thing that was, that's popular among Christianity is the pulpit, you know. And uh, I, when the Lord showed me this one day, I was invited to a church to speak. And I actually pulled up a chair in front of the congregation and sat down and, and just began to share with them. Well, some of them were kind of shocked. They looked at me, you know, like they'd never seen such a thing like that happen before. But afterwards, some of them, I think some of them got some, a little bit of freedom. They actually liked it, you know. They thought it was more biblical maybe, you know. Well, the truth is, you know, all through the scriptures, um, we don't see much of an example of the mourner's bench, the altar, um, the taking up of collections every meeting, the, oh, I'm getting on, in some trouble now, I don't know, um, many things, you know, the suits, you know, and people think you're just not holy unless you wear a suit, right? Uh, for goodness sake, you know, oh, I thank God I broke that tradition, I tell you, I hate suits with a passion, but at any rate, I have been weak to the weak. I have been known to be weak to the weak and wear a suit uh, to preach, but um, I don't like it. So I'm glad to break that tradition. But, you know, Jesus commonly, all through the scriptures, he just sat down and, and taught. And he didn't 
spit on anybody. He didn't spray anybody. He didn't uh, get red in the face. He was just a very quiet teacher. And uh, isn't that amazing? But the anointing isn't in any of that, folks. The anointing's on the truth, you know. And here it says Jesus sat down, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He sat down and taught them. Another famous uh, sermon that he gave was, um, you know, Matthew 24, the end time sermon that he gave, right? About what was going to happen in the days of Noah and the falling away and the uh, abomination of desolations and all that that people love. To, and he, the Bible says there, he just sat down and he taught them. And when they came to take Jesus, he said um, that he had sat in the temple daily teaching them. And why didn't they come and get him then? You know, why is it now in the middle of the night that they're coming to get him? But he talked about sitting there. And, he, and all through the scriptures, by the way, he never used a pulpit, never wore a suit. Why are these things so important? I mean, it, it reminds me of what Jesus said about straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. You know, things that just aren't important are important to religious people. We need freedom, folks. We need freedom. We, I'd like to get back to the example Jesus gave. You know, for a lot of reasons, I'd like to do that. Well, Jesus being our example, we can probably understand a little bit about the next verse here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I know I've asked the Lord, now, what does this mean, the poor in spirit, Lord? Yeah, explain this to me, you know. Well, one thing we know it does mean is the example that Jesus gave to us is the example of one who is poor in spirit. And, um, um, you know, what we, one thing we can see from the poor in spirit thing is, is something about the poor, something about the spirit of the poor that, that God wants in all of his people. And uh, maybe we can examine a few scriptures here and uh, come to some kinds of conclusions, you know, about what this is. I'd like to probably start here in uh, Philippians chapter 2. And um, I think it's verse 5. It says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, Counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being made in likeness of men. Now, you know, Jesus said the Gentiles love to lord it over one another, but he said it won't be that way among you. The greatest among you shall be your servant. And... Uh, Men love positions of authority, places of esteem, um, the respect of the multitudes. And uh, they just, when they come into the kingdom, they think in many cases, if they haven't been taught better, that, that what they need to do is just um, climb the corporate ladder again, you know, just like they did in the world and try to, um, try to attain to something. Well, it's the very opposite of what the worldly mind thinks. You know, I'm remembering that my, my good friend Bolivar shared with me one time about in a dream, he was searching, searching for the Lord, searching for where the Lord taught his sheep, you know, kind of like the Shulamite in Song of Solomon. And he was searching, and he went into this um, skyscraper, and he thought, surely Jesus is on the top floor and uh, teaching his disciples in the penthouse. That would be a royal, you know, uh, according to the way a lot of the church people think, you know, if you, if you don't have a fancy building, you're really not honoring God. Uh, never really impressed Jesus, did it, you know. So anyway, he uh, got in the elevator and went up to the penthouse and opened the door and went in and um, looked around, didn't see Jesus, and the window was open, and in came a dragon, you know, flying in the window. It was the devil, you know. And he quick jumped back in the elevator and took off to the, to the basement. And when he went into the basement, there was Jesus sitting in a very um, humble surroundings, teaching his disciples, just like he always was, right, in the scriptures. Uh, uh, a humble surrounding. He preferred the humble surrounding. He preferred the, uh, the spirit of the poor, 
right? He preferred to hang out with the spirit of the poor, right? And, uh, you know, Jesus in, in Matthew 23, um, let me read that to you. Matthew 23, verse 10, I think it is. He said, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even the Christ. But he that is great, greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be humbled, and whosoever shall humble himself shall be exalted. The Lord um, uh, loves a humble people a people that are not exalting themselves, putting themselves before God, over and above God, um, much like a child would be. You know, uh, Mark speaks about that. Mark chapter 9, I believe it is. And verse 35, He sat down, there it is again, and called the twelve, and he said unto them, If any man would be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one such little children in my name, one of the such little children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever receiveth me, Receiveth not me, but him that sent me. So, a child is um, is humble. Somebody who is willing to be the least in the midst and not uncomfortable about it at all. Quite comfortable to sit in the midst of people that are larger and, and older and more mature and be a child. Very comfortable to be there. And, um, you know, it should be that way among us. You know, because Jesus said, that's what I'm like. You know, and uh, you, you remember Jesus washing the disciples' feet and being very comfortable about it. And uh, Peter thought, no, this is beneath Jesus. Lord, not so. You're not going to wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash your feet, I don't have any part in you. You know, and obviously he meant uh, sanctification, right? Our walk, cleaning up our walk in this world. He became a servant and uh, he commanded us to have that same mind in Philippians. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not being on an equality with God, a thing to be clutched to or grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, Yea, the death of the cross. Wherefore, God highly exalted him. Well, praise God. Well, that's, if we're to have this same mind, we've come here to be a servant, not a ruler. We don't seek the position of ruler. We don't seek the positions in the church. We desire just to be a servant, just to serve God's people. And the better the job and the less we really lust after the position, the more Able God is to bring us to that place, even give us a position. Uh, but the people who lust after the position are not qualified. Uh, it's the people that don't want it. It's the people that really uh, want are running after the Lord with all their heart. They desire after Him that God begins to open the door and give them that position. You know, the people that desire and lust after the position, they're not qualified. You know. Um, uh, Jesus said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let me read that to you. You know, the poor are used all through the scriptures and, um, and uh, the promises, by the way, brethren, are made to the poor. And if you see this as the poor in spirit in the church, I mean, the Old Testament it speaks much of the poor, especially in Psalms. But if you see this in a, a spiritual light as though it was a parable and you speak of the, the poor in spirit, you know, um, because now you're looking at the spiritual revelation here, um, then you can see an awful lot of things. Well, notice here it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 
um, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So when he laid aside his omnipotence and um, kingly position in heaven, he didn't clutch to it, he didn't grab to it, he came down to become a servant, and then he tells us this is what our mind must be. We've got to become a servant. We've got to be willing to be the lowest, uh, the least. Uh, the servant of all is the greatest among you, Jesus said. You know, uh, For your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Well, notice, he came down. He left that position and came down, and in that poverty, the Bible calls it poverty. You know, some people want to say Jesus was was rich because of his seamless garment, for goodness sake. You know, what silliness can you get out of that? I mean, come on now. I mean, that's a stretch, isn't it? Well, no, the Bible says he wasn't rich. He was poor. Um, and it goes on to say, And herein I give my judgment, for this is expedient for you, who were the first to make a beginning a year ago, and not only to do, but also to will. In other words, hey, you do just what he did. That's what he's commanding here, to walk in his steps. You can't abide in Christ unless you walk in his steps. Now think about that. That's uh, an interesting thought, to walk in the steps of Jesus, you know. I had a, a pastor one time ask me, he said, uh, we were talking about this, and he asked me this question. He said, David, would you, would you say that um, poverty is a curse? And uh, I said to him, well, it's definitely listed there among the curse in Deuteronomy 28. I said, but here's the way I see it, that forced poverty is a curse uh, because you're brought under its dominion. You have no choice whatsoever. However, we see the example of Jesus. We th see the example of his disciples that um, they willingly uh, took up a position of poverty because they really didn't want to be distracted by the world nor the things of the world nor the love of the world. And as you know, folks, in, in a time of prosperity is when the church goes through its greatest trials. If you can't destroy the church by temptation, all you got to do is bring them into prosperity and peace. And, and pretty soon they're just as lukewarm as they can be. History has proven this. You know, Bring them into trouble, the true church grows up, the tares are separated, and you got a holy body there. Bring them into peace and prosperity. That's the best way to corrupt them. And um, the devil knows that. Well, Jesus wasn't tempted with a lot of things that people are, you know. And uh, in Timothy chapter 6, it talks about that uh, those that are will desirous to be rich are, are um, uh, pierced through with many foolish and hurtful lusts, such as drown men in destruction and perdition. But, but thou, O man of God, flee these things, you know, we're told. And so the truth is, Jesus didn't have to flee them. He, he never liked them in the first place. And his disciples caught on right away. They didn't have any use for all the love of the world and the things of the world. They wanted to be servants of God. And they were. They went everywhere they went. They served the people of God. They didn't go there to rule over them. They went there to serve them. And the Lord Jesus says that that's exactly what he did so that we through his poverty might become rich, not in the things of the world, but in the things of the kingdom, rich in the fruit of God, rich in the righteousness that, that the Lord gives. So um, he tells us very plainly here that, that he wants us to walk in that same fruit and uh, become servants to God's people. And if we'll do that, God will uh, promote us to positions in his kingdom, although it won't look like the positions of the worldly church or the leadership of the worldly church. He will promote us in his kingdom. He will give us authority. He will, to him that overcometh will I give authority, the Lord said. Um, authority doesn't come from a certificate. and It doesn't come from going to a Bible school. Authority comes from overcoming. So we have to be tried to overcome. And one thing we're being tried is, are we going to walk in the steps of Jesus? Are we going to be servants as he was a servant? 
You know, uh, Matthew 8, let me read this to you, Matthew 8 and 20. And Jesus said, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the heavens have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Wow, sounds like Jesus was, uh, was really poor. He didn't even have his own donkey, you know. Um, there's a lot of things Jesus didn't have, but one thing he wasn't is, is poor in the things of the kingdom. Everywhere he went, his needs were met because he was a man of faith. But he had no greed. Uh, he wasn't trying to keep up with the Joneses. He wasn't competitive. And so he didn't need what he didn't need. He didn't need things that were distracting him and, and dragging him down. He took all of his pleasure in serving God's people. He was poor in spirit. Okay. And he's called us to be poor in spirit. Spirit, Blessed are the poor in spirit, he says. And we see there that Jesus wasn't rich in the things of the world. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, there is a little parable there in verse 13. Notice what he says. Better is a poor and a wise youth than an old and a foolish king who knoweth not how to receive admonition anymore. Wow, you know, Jesus was the real king of this world. And look at his life and look at his lifestyle. Yet there was King Herod, much older and very foolish, and um, all the accoutrements of, of the um, uh, prosperity life around him, anything he wanted, total authority, which is very dangerous to put in anybody's hands because they'll just bring themselves straight to hell with it, you know. Uh, you, you can't give authority to a carnal man, even in the church. If you do, um, they'll bring judgment upon them. Ultimately, it will bring judgment upon them. Well, but the king of kings was someone who sought to serve people. He was truly the king of this world. He was truly a king, and he was truly anointed to be king, like David was anointed to be king. Before Jesus started his ministry, he was anointed, and uh, as the kings were in the Old Testament. And um, as a type, I might add. But better is the poor and wise youth. You know, Jesus, I mean, they were, think about the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. These leaders, most all of them were older than Jesus. These were uh, wise men according to their religion, you know. But Jesus, think about Jesus when he started his ministry, 30 years old. He was a very young man. And the Bible says he was poor. That is, poor in the world's thinking. He certainly wasn't poor in the kingdom's thinking. He, had, he was uh, very, very rich in the, in the kingdom's thinking. Well, he goes on to say, uh, verse 14, For out of prison he came forth to be king. Yes. In other words, Jesus manifested full kingdom authority. Uh, when he came out of prison, he went and preached to the souls in prison. And when he came forth from that, um, he received full kingdom authority. But he had kingdom authority over God's people down here and over the curse when it involved them down here. And he exercised that, right? And some people see Joseph here, you know, because Jesus, Joseph also came out of prison, who was a type of Jesus, and uh, became king. And by the way, that's also the man-child's ministry in the end time. Uh, yea, even in his kingdom, he was born poor. Well, we know Jesus. Why didn't God choose better than what he received when he came into this world, you know? I mean, they laid him in a manger. He, there was no room for him at the end. You'd think God would have provided better for him if he was a prosperity-minded God, right? But no, the Lord wanted him to be a servant. He wanted to, to liken him to humble people. He wanted um, him to be an example of um, the kind of king he was sending. Of course, you know what the prosperity folks of that day uh, expected. They didn't expect a humble servant. 
They expected a king to come and rule over the Romans. They wanted a king kind of like that old and foolish king, King Herod, somebody that would be in a position of authority and give him authority over the Romans. Well, God saw it quite the opposite, and he still does. And you know the Pharisees are still looking for somebody that has that kind of authority. They delve into politics. They try to find position. They try to get authority over the world. They do exercise worldly authority in their organizations, like the Pharisees did. Notice Jesus' authority. He didn't, didn't run around giving a lot of commands to people and, and, and um, exercising that kind of authority. His authority was because people willingly submitted to him for their own good. That's the kind of authority he had, quite contrary to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Even in his own kingdom, he was born poor. I saw all the living that walk under the sun, that they were with the youth. All the living that walk under the sun. There's a pun there, a parable there, right? Uh, all of the living, they, they do walk under the sun, and they're with this youth. And not only that, the second that stood up in his stead. You know that the man-child ministry is coming. Jesus spoke about it in John 16, uh, a ministry that was going to be raised up, born of the woman that was in travail. Well, we see that in, Matthew, in Revelation chapter 12, right? That's a ministry that's being raised up in our day in the likeness of Jesus' ministry. Get ready for it. If you don't know about it, you need to study that because you need to recognize these people when they come. They're going to be used of God greatly. But it's, it's the king of kings who's inside that counts. It's not the flesh that he, he lives in. It's the king of kings inside. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the one that's coming to rule right there. There was no end of all the people, even of all them over whom he was. Yet they that came after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and striving after wind. Isn't it so that a lot of the people of so-called people of God who came after Jesus uh, are not celebrating in the real, true Jesus? They're not um, rejoicing in the real, true Jesus. They, uh, they have quite a different Jesus that's in agreement with their, their lifestyle, the lifestyle that they desire to live. Not that of a servant, not that of a poor person who is uh, willingly giving up their life in order to serve God, uh, not running after the world, not competing with the world, not um, um, having all the world's goods. A humble servant. Well, do you know that not only did Jesus come that way, but that's the only people he really came to talk to. You know, uh, Luke chapter 4 speaks about the people he came to bring the gospel to, right? Let me read that to you. Verse 18, here's his anointing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Something about the poor. Uh, something about the poor in spirit that they can receive Jesus' words that they're not offended with the kind of Jesus that offended the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was quite a different Jesus. He's quite a different Jesus than is being preached nowadays. And uh, yes, he does expect us to walk in his steps. And you know what? He's going to have his way. He's going to have a people who are going to walk in his steps. They are going to manifest his life. He is going to live in them. Oh, glory be to God. And this is uh, the really good news. So what is blessed? If, this, if those who are poor in spirit are blessed, and Jesus was blessed, although Jesus willingly gave up the blessings that he had and, and, and he could have had, you know that Jesus could have been as, as an eloquent a speaker as he was, as able to reach out and touch people like he was. He could have done what a lot of the other kings did have done in our day. He could have built a kingdom. He could have built an awesome kingdom. He could have had the nicest church in town, folks. Um, he wouldn't have got the Pharisees in there or the Sadducees in there, but the multitudes liked to listen to him. 
he was uh, he was somebody who kind of got down on their level, you know. Uh, he had authority. He spoke as one that had authority, but he kind of got down on their level. I like to hear that. Now, some of them weren't willing to go quite as far as the cross, but they liked to hear it, you know. And uh, he could have filled churches, folks. He could have filled churches. He could have been a. Uh, he could have been what the devil offered him. The devil offered him to be king, and he refused it. He turned it down. So, what is it that is blessed? You know, who is it that is blessed? Don't we want to be blessed? What is a blessing? I mean, you know, uh, let me look in, uh, let's look in, um, I believe it's Isaiah 41. I'm thinking, uh, yeah, Isaiah 41. You know, when I started thinking about this earlier today, I uh, verses came into my mind and I just started flipping my Bible, and every time I flipped my page, it would come open to the verse I was, you know, I'm just flipping my Bible open, it would come open to the page that had come into my mind. And I knew the Lord was giving me a firm confirmation that He wanted us to talk on this. Uh, Isaiah 41 and verse 8 says, But thou, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, the Lord's servant, Verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. He's assuring, comforting his people, uh, his servants. Are we really his servants? Are we really poor in spirit that we will listen to him? We will hear his words? Jump down to verse 14. It says, again, same thing. Fear not, thou worm Jacob. Wow, a worm is a pretty lowly creature, isn't he? Why does he call his servant a worm? <laughs> That's about as low as you can get, right? Jesus said the very least among you will be the greatest, didn't he? And now he's talking about his, his, uh, the, the, the uh, seed of his friend Abraham as a worm. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. A worm's a pretty lowly creature. He's a very weak creature, but you know what? God's power is made perfect in our weakness, and we shouldn't make any bones about it. Lord, we're weak. We're lowly. You know, we can't do it. You can, right? Thou worm, Jacob, O ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I have made thee to be a, a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt winnow them. A worm can do all this? Yeah, wow. That's a pretty powerful worm we're talking about here. Thou shalt winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away. The whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord. Thou shalt Glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and the needy seek water. Now he's still talking about these, these wormy people here, you know. Uh, the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none. And their tongue faileth for thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open the rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys, and I will make the wilderness a pool of water, and the dry land springs of water, and I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, uh, so on and so forth. Sounds like a blessing, right? And who is he blessing? You know, but these wormy people, <laughs> these, uh, these very lowly people, the poor, he says, the poor, the poor and the needy. Are you needy? Are you poor? You know, I, I, I don't, you know, David said, I won't be satisfied until I awaken thy likeness. He always felt needy. He always felt like he didn't have enough of God, you know. He was poor. He was needy. And the Lord, um, for those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, they're poor in the things of the kingdom. They cry out to God, and God is there. He is a, a faithful Savior in the things of the kingdom. But 
some people are quite satisfied. You know, they think they, they have in the world all they need. They're just sitting down waiting for the rapture to happen, and uh, they're going to fly away. And other than that, seeking God is the furthest thing from their mind. You know, it's kind of like a chore to go to church on Sunday sometimes, you know. But um, God promises his blessings upon the poor those who are of like mind with Jesus, those who have come here just to be servants, you know, not to be lords and, and, and rulers and the rich, you know, um, but they came here to be servants. They came here to serve God with everything that they have. And they put everything that they have in the hands of the Lord. You know, God said that he would deliver these people that he, obviously there in Isaiah 41, that he would provide for them richly everything that they need. And Philippians chapter 4 says the same thing. My God shall supply your every need according to his riches and glory. You know, and he was talking about the servants of God. Um, Psalm 35. And um, In verse 10, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee? Who deliverest the poor from him that's too strong for him? Uh, worms are not strong creatures, are they? Uh, delivers the poor from him that is too strong for him. Yea, the poor and the needy from him that robbeth him. The Lord is a deliverer to the poor. The Lord is a, the Lord is a, you know, he feels like we do sometimes. He, he likes the, the underdog, you know. He kind of takes the side of the underdog, you know. Well, God's people are going to be in that position, uh, and many, many cases are in that position. And um, all that uh, forsake the world and run after Jesus and seek to be servants are, are putting themselves in that position. And if they don't put themselves in that position, God's got a way of putting those that are truly his in that position anyway. And we're headed towards a great tribulation here in which God's people will be put in that position in a place of weakness, a place of worldly poverty. You know, but God says that he's going to deliver them. He's going to be their savior. Now, who would you rather be? You know, the rich that are crying out for the rocks to fall on them? Or would you rather be the poor? Now, I'm not talking physical, you know, because I know that there are a lot of people that come into the kingdom that have lots of money, and they, they use their money to make sure that the needs are met in the kingdom, and they're faithful people, they're servants of God. You know, and, and of course, that's true for, for uh, anybody that comes into the kingdom. Uh, Paul said, be ready to uh, communicate. It means share, right? And, of course, we hope that they are, you're all doing that. But we're talking about poor in spirit here, right? There are people that are, that, are, um, uh, uh, that are in a position where they're not the strongest people in the world, but, um, but God is going to be their Savior because they, they're weak and their trust is in God, you know. Um, chapter 12, Psalm chapter 12. Verse 5, it says, Because of the oppression of the poor, because of the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, says the Lord, and I will set him in the safety that he panteth for. God's going to protect the poor in spirit. In other words, they are blessed in God's deliverance. They're blessed in God's safety in the days to come. I tell you, uh, it sounds to me like the poor are pretty rich, right? If they got the Lord on their side as their deliverer, as their, uh, the one who will bless them and provide for them in the wilderness, as the one who will give them a place of safety, sounds like they're pretty rich in the things of the kingdom, doesn't it? Well, it says, Now will I arise, saith the Lord, and I will set him in the safety that he panteth for. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth. Wow, isn't that something? He, he's bringing us forth as silver and gold. But you wouldn't say the people, according to the world, that are being brought forth as silver and gold are, are rich people. 
except rich in the things of the kingdom and in the fruit of God. And um, as silver is tried in a furnace on the earth, purified seven times, thou wilt keep them, O Lord, thou wilt preserve them from this generation forever. What generation is that? Well, this wicked generation is what he's talking about. He's going to keep them and he's going to preserve them, those that are poor in spirit. Going to keep them and preserve them. And the wicked walk on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Oh, aren't we seeing it today, folks? Amen to that. Bad deal. Look out there. It's corruption everywhere. The world's falling apart. People are taking advantage of other people. And when they can, if they're in a position to, to get it over on them, they'll persecute them and they'll kill them. There's a lot of wickedness going on out there, and we haven't seen anything yet. Well, it looks to me like there is a place of safety to have that spirit of the poor. You know, have you ever noticed the difference between the poor and the rich? Have you ever seen the, the normal difference in their attitudes? You know, do they, uh, um, are these people that are uh, expecting, um, expecting um, uh, the respect of the world, or do they just kind of are much more humble concerning that? They're much more humble concerning that. And, I, you know, I used to, um, when I was young in the Lord, I used to go out and go door to door, knock on the doors and talk to people about the Lord. And I found that I was much happier going into poor parts of town because these people would listen. And I'd go in the rich parts of town. They didn't want to hear it. They'd tell me what religion they were. I wouldn't care about their religion. I wasn't interested in their religion. You know, I want to talk to them about Jesus, you know. They wanted to tell me what religion they were. I go into poor parts of town. It didn't matter what religion they were. They wanted to talk to me a lot of times, you know. And so, I, I you know, when we would, a bunch of us would divide up to go to different parts, I'd pick the poorest part of town. That's the part I wanted to go to. I always went there because it was much more fruitful. I mean, who did Jesus say he was going to preach the gospel to? The poor. Because they understand a lot more about the kingdom. You know, look at uh, Psalm 107. And verse 40, he poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the waste where there is no way. Yet setteth he the needy on high above affliction. Wow. Now, whose shoes would you like to be in here? You know, just read this and take, take some close uh, reconnoitering here. Whose shoes would you like to be in? He setteth, yet setteth he the needy on high from affliction, and maketh him families like a flock. The upright shall see it and be glad. Notice the upright respect the poor because they are shall see it and be glad and all iniquity shall stop her mouth whoso is wise will give heed to these things and they will consider the loving kindness of the lord those that are wise will consider these things don't worry about if you're not people of means um don't worry about if you're not keeping up with the world and they don't respect you. They're not supposed to respect you. We need the respect of God. And guess what? We're looking here at who he respects. Now, would you rather have the favor of God here? Um, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Verse 8, he raiseth up the poor out of the dust. He lifteth up the needy from the dunghill to make them sit with princes and inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Oh, glory be to God. He has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his holy ones. 
You, he's going to enable them to walk in the kingdom, walk sanctified, walk holy. But the wicked shall he put to silence in darkness. Well, he is going to lift up. He is going to exalt. The needy, praise be to God. He provides for his people, folks. Now look at Psalm 68, back in Psalms again, because Psalm has so much to say about this, the poor in spirit. And what is a blessing? You know, that's a blessing. The Lord is going to cause them to inherit the throne of his kingdom. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 8. Psalm 68 Uh, verse 7. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, the earth trembled, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Yon Sinai trembled at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou, God, didst send a plentiful rain. Thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation dwelt therein. Thou, O God, didst prepare of thy goodness for the poor. Thou didst prepare of thy goodness for the poor. So many promises about the poor. And, you know, if we bring it over into the New Testament, we can see exactly what Jesus is talking about. Again, we're not, you know, um, we're not putting down the rich. We're just saying that the spirit that the poor have is the one that Jesus is after. And he wants all of his people to have just such a spirit as that. The Bible says in, in James chapter 2 and verse 5, uh, didn't God choose them that are poor to the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Well, you know why the poor need to trust in God and walk by faith in God? It's just for that very purpose. They don't have any uh, worldly ability you know, uh, to provide for themselves. They cry out to the Lord. They have needs. And the Lord always, always answers them. I want to share a testimony with you. Um, I got this today, matter of fact, when I was meditating on these things, and I just knew the Lord wanted me to share it. This is from uh, Becky Hayes. He says, she says, In the fall of 1988, after a tragic and unforeseen event, I found myself alone and responsible to raise my two daughters, ages 2 and 12. I turned to the Lord, and He drew close to me, closer than any human could have ever done. In those days of great despair, the Lord became my best friend, my husband, a father to my kids, a confidant, a defender, a provider, and a comforter. Isaiah 54 and 5 says, Thy Maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is thy Redeemer, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. And Isaiah 54 and 6, For the Lord hath called thee as a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even a wife of youth, when she is cast off, saith thy God. With the constant care and direction from the Lord also came many miracles during this time of my life. As finances were very slim, I had to trust God for many of the very basic needs of life, and He never failed me. One of the miracles was how God returned my stolen car to me. During this time, my sister-in-law and her two children had moved in with us to help share expenses as she too had found herself alone. We had gone to the grocery store that evening and, and bought milk and diapers and a few other essentials. We then went to another store to see if we could find an inexpensive telephone as mine had uh, quit working. We only had $10 left between us, and even though I had never seen a phone sold for that little amount before, I had a feeling we would be able to find one that, that we could afford. 
I knew that God said he would supply all of our needs, and this was a need. My oldest daughter had uh, to babysit the, the younger children a little while each day and uh, needed a telephone in case of an emergency. As it happened, the story we went to was, was no longer going to carry telephones and had them at a closeout sale, and we were able to get a $50 telephone for $7. Glory to God. While we were leaving the store and praising the Lord for supplying our needs again, we, we looked in the parking lot and could not find our car. <laughs> it was gone. When realization hit me that someone had stolen the car, a miracle happened within me. That's hard to explain. Well, uh, didn't God choose them that are poor to the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Listen to this. The best way I can describe it is an unbelievable joy and confidence rose up within me, coming up from out of my belly. Like John 7 and 38 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. An exciting expectation. I knew that I was about to see a miracle. God was going to either bring my car back to me or he would provide us with another car with milk and food already in it. <laughs> it really didn't matter to me how he did it. We needed a car, and we needed the groceries that were in that car. Praise God, we knew it was coming our way. When the police came, they put the description of the car over the police radio, and, and officers in the area were looking for the car. The officer that responded to our call allowed us to ride around with him and look for the car for a while. He said he had never met anyone like us before in his life. He had responded to many calls like ours before, stolen vehicles and such, but never had anyone acted the way that we were acting. He could see that we were very happy and excited, and, he, and we told him that we were going to see a miracle. We told him that the car was coming back, or God would send us another one with the groceries already in it. He was being very nice and patient with us. <laughs> he, he also did not want to discourage us, but he said the chances were very slim that we would be able to recover the car. I said, don't worry. God has everything under control. I asked the officer uh, what thieves did with stolen cars. He said, a lot of times they would break them down and sell them as parts. Uh, they could also be used in a robbery before they're torn down. And my sister-in-law and I immediately agreed together in prayer that the car belonged to the Lord and could not be used in any crime. I'm sure the officer was thinking that we were crazy by this time, but he seemed to be enjoying the change from the norm. By this time, the car had been missing for over an hour. Uh, the store where the car was stolen was at the edge of town and at a fork in the road between two highways leading out of town. So the car could have been in the next county and in another town by this time. Well, just then, a call came in over the radio saying that the car had been found and pulled over just a mile from the store. It was on one of the highways headed back towards the grocery store. It turns out that it was a professional car thief with a long record of such crimes. And when they were caught, they told the police officer that when they saw the baby car seat in the back seat, they had an overwhelming feeling and had to return the car. <laughs> Praise God, the car was in perfect shape and the groceries were fine. The milk was as cold as if it just came out of the refrigerator, and the police officer knew that he had just witnessed a miracle. Well, glory to God. Well, God, you know, everything on this earth serves him, you know, and you can't get anywhere where God can't save you, but he loves to save the poor. He loves to save those that um, they can't fend for themselves, can't take care of themselves. They're at God's at his mercy, but they trust in him. And God 
chose them that are poor to the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. God can cause faith. He does. He causes faith to rise up in the heart of his people and to save them in every situation. The Lord is our Savior. He's our Savior in all things. Uh, he will never fail us. He will never forsake us. He is there all of the time. And according to these many scriptures we've looked at, um, he is a blessing to the poor. Considering the days that we're coming to, folks, I don't know why you'd want to be anything but poor, you know, to put your life in the hands of the Lord. You know, he brought his people into so many very hard places uh, in the wilderness when he brought them out of Egypt. And each one of those places was a, a place, it was a revelation of their weakness and his strength. And uh, that's where we're headed, folks. Uh, believe it or not, where we're going, almost everybody's going to be poor. But some people are going to be poor in spirit. And um, those people are going to have the help of the Lord. They're going to have the, the uh, provision of the Lord. Uh, he's going to be their protector. He's going to be their deliverer. Um, he's going to exalt them. He's going to provide for them. He's going to give them faith. This is, this is what it is to be blessed of the Lord. This is what it is, if you're poor in spirit, to have his blessings, you know. So put if you are weak, hey, you're in the place of miracles, you know. If you are poor, you're in the place of miracles. If you are a servant of God, one who only desires to serve him and puts that above everything else, you're in a place of miracles. God is going to bless you. He's going to provide for you abundantly. Put your trust in him and worship him. God bless you, saints. We'll do it again sometime. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.